In the 1970s, long before Brian Bethel told the world of his encounter with a trio of black-eyed kids in a parking lot in Texas, another story involving black-eyed beings came to light courtesy UFO investigators Joel Mesnard and Jean-Marie Bagorn. The chilling incident was said to have occurred in a small village in Ain, France. Mesnard and Bagoin claimed that one autumn afternoon in 1974, at around 3 p.m., two men, Elaine G. and Patrick V., were out driving in Patrick's vehicle, touring the little village. Out of a sense of boredom, they decided to venture down a road rarely traveled and check out the scenery. They had planned on doing a U-turn and coming back. Sadly, as they embarked down the road, little did they know they would soon come face to face with true terror. Happening upon the last house in the village at the end of the road, Patrick eased to the right hand side and stopped in front of the home. Patrick was about ready to put it into reverse and back up and head back down the road. But that's when the two men realized that some figures were standing there in the courtyard of the home. There were five of them. They looked like children, but they weren't children. Also, where had they come from? The two men wondered. They hadn't noticed them when they pulled over. Three of them were in the background to the left. Another walked slowly along the front of the house and touched it with two hands. The fifth, situated in the middle of the courtyard, stood staring directly at Elaine and Patrick. Elaine decided to roll down the right front window of the car. He quickly regretted it as he found himself only three meters from one of the beings. A chill went down his spine. Whatever they were, they certainly were human. And just being in their presence, the two men sensed great menace, as if something terrible was going to happen to them. The two men described what these beings looked like to investigators. They claimed that they had similar looking bodies, each standing a little over four feet tall, and wearing long dresses that almost reached the ground. The dresses were decorated with multicolored spots. They described that the skin on their faces and hands was an earthy yellow color, and they had prominent billiard ball sized eyes that they claimed were like quote black hemispheres unquote further the beings had long hair that hung down to their waists and noses that appeared to be compressed inwards they had mouths too but they never opened them Patrick desperate to leave was having trouble getting his car to start Elaine noticed that the being near the house was now frozen in place Watching them, the one closest to the car appeared to smile at them, a sinister grin. As if in a holding pattern, the two men sat inside the car watching and waiting. Just then, the being nearest to them gestured with its arm and hand as if to say, Come. This was too much for the two men who began panicking. Overcome with fright, Elaine screamed at his friend to get them out of there. Patrick managed to get the car going and put it into reverse, backing up into a space left open by a dilapidated barn. Cranking the wheel and punching the gas, they quickly sped away in the direction of the town, leaving the strange beings far behind them. A few hours later, Elaine and Patrick ventured back to the house, this time with a small group of friends. Nobody was there and there was nothing left to indicate the presence of these strange beings, minus Elaine and Patrick's word. 
It took another eight months before an investigator would arrive in the area to examine the courtyard and speak to the people living around the village. To that investigator's surprise, somebody else had seen something that lined up with Elaine and Patrick's bizarre story. Early in the afternoon, the same day the two men had their sighting, a neighbor recalled seeing, standing in front of the same house, quote, children dressed in yellow oilcloth, unquote. At the time, they had thought the sight peculiar, but ultimately brushed it off. In my video, Dog Aliens and Other Oddities, I spoke of a number of cases in which people claim to have encountered dogmen or werewolf type creatures on board UFOs. I alluded to the fact that these werewolf or dogmen creatures might actually be aliens. Recently, author Lon Strickler, curator of the Phantoms and Monsters blog site, referred to a letter which was sent to him titled My Wolf Story which contain a very curious account, one which further adds to the block of cases in which werewolf-type cryptids are somehow linked to ufology. In the letter sent to Lon, the witness claims that sometime in the 1970s, when they were all of four or five years of age, they were visited by two strange beings in the night. The incident occurred in Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York. It was late in the evening. The witness was in bed when they slowly began to sense that they were being watched. Like somebody was outside the window looking in. It was a strange sensation, like a tingle of emotion. Given that a metal fire escape, typical of the kind you might find on buildings of that era, led up from the ground to the child's window, it certainly was not out of the realm of possibility that some drunkard, or worse, might be standing there peering in. The witness recalls getting up to look and seeing two entities sitting or crouching out on the fire escape looking in at them. Instead of feeling terrified, the witness inexplicably felt at ease and wandered over to the window. A nightlight allowed the witness to see them clearly. Sitting in front of them was a twisted version of Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. To the left of the witness was a girl with large eyes and skin that almost glowed. She was wearing a red hood on her head that had some kind of yellow or golden writing of runes along the edge of the hood that inched close to her face and down her neck. The hood was so large the witness could not tell if she had any hair. In her eyes the witness sensed calmness and caring. To the right, the girls laughed, stood her companion. To the witness it looked like a dog, but different. The being was large and canine-like quote, like a dog person, unquote. His fur was dark, and a single braid ran down from the left side of its head past the windowsill, starting at the ear. Even though its face was vicious looking, the witness sensed a soft emotion in its eyes. Regarding what happened next, I will quote directly from the witness. Quote, They did not speak, but I could feel such a powerful sense of familiarity with them as if I have known them as my own family, as I approached them, wanting to go with them, I began to feel another emotion that slowly crept in. This feeling was uncomfortable and sad, as if my mommy and daddy were going away and I did not want them to go. I felt sadness and I struggled against it because I wanted to go with them, but they were trying to push me away gently. After another short moment, I don't know how long, I suddenly felt fear. It was not my own but it was projected into me, like when a loved one suddenly lashes out at you and you can't understand why. I suddenly became afraid of them as the image of, as strange as it may sound, Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf was projected into my mind. I can be honest that as a child I never found that story scary at all. Once I felt this sudden fear, I turned and ran screaming. It was as if they were telling me goodbye, a difficult goodbye, 
but I felt it clearly, unquote. Since then, the witnesses had a longing for their return. Certainly, as strange as this account is, it isn't the only one of its type. In fact, roughly a decade before the prior event, another incident took place in another area of New York, this time West Corners, also involving beings visiting children in the middle of the night. This case was reported to the National UFO Reporting Center in February 1998. The similarities between the two cases are striking, despite that they were reported nearly 20 years apart. According to the New Fork case, two witnesses, one five, the other four, recalled numerous times seeing beings appearing in their window. The incidents took place always before noon as the children were watching TV and the mother was occupied in the other room. The five-year-old recalls playing with their toys and feeling like they were being watched. Sensing that it was coming from the window, the five-year-old walked up to the window and looked out. To their surprise, a being, described by the witness as looking like a typical gray, big head, large black eyes, appeared dressed in a red vest. The child screamed for their mother at the same instance the being disappeared. It continued to happen and the witness would always see the being for 5 to 10 seconds from the waist up, always dressed in a red vest. It would remain in the window until the witness moved. Later, one night, the child's four-year-old sister recalls seeing a wolf-like creature which she called, quote, Wolf Man, coming across the bedroom towards her. She would turn to run but would become paralyzed and fall to the floor. The fingers of the creature were so long that they wrapped completely around her body when they picked her up. The sister recalls being taken to a room filled with toys and being laid down on a table. She further recalled a rod being used on her on what the witness believed to be similar to a nerve induction test. The witness and their four-year-old sister both clearly remember these beings without the help of hypnosis. And while the witness does not recall seeing the beings in their bedroom or being abducted, they do recall seeing the gray and the wolf-like creature, which the witness described as, quote, wolf in a red vest, unquote. I just find the uh, similarities between two cases to be interesting. Uh, they're both they're both take place in, in New York. Uh, they both happen around the same time. Um, they both involve children. The witnesses are children. They both involve two types of beings. In, um, in both instances, uh, there was a werewolf type creature, and there was either a gray or a hybrid. Uh, the hybrid reminded me a lot of. Uh, the one, the being described by Helen Luttrell in her book, Rachel's Eyes, um, the, uh, the beings were wearing red uh, clothing, in Long Story it was a robe, in the New Fork case it was a, uh, a red vest. Uh, they both involved the beings looking in windows at the witnesses. Uh, they both, uh, in both s stories, they both the witnesses describe sensing something, you know, as the beings were looking at them. I don't know, there's just a lot of uh, similarities between the New Fork case and, and the case that uh, that Lon got. I, I just found it interesting. A pilot in Alaska watches as his wife is carried off into the woods by a large hairy hominid. This story, as told to bear behaviorist author Larry Canuet, was supposedly written up in Alaska Magazine in 1985. Alaska Magazine was founded in 1935 and continues to be published to this day. According to Canuet's friend Jack Altney, who read the article and related it to Canuet, a pair of newlyweds were en route from Nome, where the husband, a pilot, lived to Anchorage where they would make connections for their honeymoon. The husband was flying a Cessna 180 or 185 and sometime during the trip the weather turned sour so to be safe he decided to land on a lake. He taxied to shore where he and his wife looked for a spot to pitch their tent for the night. Having found one he turned toward the plane to fetch the tent with his wife following behind him. At this point 
something horrible happened. The man suddenly heard erupt a terrible scream. It was his wife. He turned to see a hairy biped running from the location towards the wood with his wife slung under one arm kicking and screaming. The pilot gave chase into the woods but stopped when he realized that he was unarmed. He raced back to the plane to get his rifle. Charging back into the woods, he was able to follow them for some time, even seeing them three times before eventually losing sight of them. Later, he found an article of cloth from his wife's garment. From there, things get kind of murky. Galton could not recall whether the pilot had spent the night in his tent and looked the next day, or flew on to Anchorage and reported the event to the Alaska State Troopers, who began a search but were unable to come up with any positive results. The wife was never found, and according to Jack, the pilot was never the same again. Was this story true? Despite his best efforts to locate a copy of the Alaska magazine with the story included, Larry has not been able to confirm it. Interestingly, this isn't the first time this has happened. On June 1, 1987, 16 year old Fresno native Teresa Ann Byer set off for the Sierra Nevada mountains of California with her much older friend Russell Welsh. It was the last time she was seen alive. When Welsh returned, he was alone. Upon questioning by police, Walsh claims that at some point after arriving and setting up camp, they had become separated. Walsh claims that he heard screams for help coming from the woods. It was Teresa. Welsh told investigators that he believed that she had been abducted by a Bigfoot. A search of the area where the two had camped was immediately ordered, but failed to turn up anything. Despite the continued efforts of dedicated searchers, no sign of Teresa Ambire was found. Russell Welch was later charged with child stealing and was scheduled to stand trial. However, officials abruptly dropped the charges and Welch was allowed to go free. Absolutely no sign of Teresa Ann Byer has been found in the nearly 25 years that have passed since the incident. Thank you.